Welcome to church, we're so glad you're here. Let's put our hands together. Let's lift up the King of Kings this morning. Come on. Sing our God.
God, your name breaks chains in the name of Jesus. We thank you that there's power in your name, that we can attach our lives to the name of Jesus. You change everything. You change everything.
commit today to build our life upon your love. God, we'll put our trust in you. Lord, in a room of this size, we're at many different seasons of life. And this may look different at a different stage of life. For a student, it may look different than someone with a family or someone retired later in life. Lord, but we understand, even though it's not always easy and we don't know exactly what to do, building our life upon you and your love for us just comes down to taking simple steps. We choose today to trust you, God. We choose to put our hope in you. Lord, when, when the world or when culture or when our feelings tell us to go this way, Lord, we choose to lean into your word and your truth and your love because we know as we take those steps, you'll show yourself faithful. You'll lead us to a life that's better than any life we could build on our own. So God, we choose to put our trust in you. We thank you for your presence and your goodness and all the ways that you show yourself faithful in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we want to welcome you. You can go ahead and stay standing for just a second. If you wouldn't mind doing me this little favor, we got a full room this morning. If there's a seat, an empty seat, could you scoot together right where you're at? so that our ushers and our team can help people who don't have a seat find one. Appreciate you doing that. As you're doing that, if you're joining us for the first time, I wanna tell you, we're so glad that you're here. It's always a privilege. We know there's a lot of ways you could spend your weekend. We're grateful that you're spending it with us. Now I know, as you came in, we gave you a bunch of different pieces. We gave you a service guide and a missions brochure. If you're joining us for the first time, there's one more piece I wanna call your attention to. It's a little communication card there in front. You say, why do you pass out all this stuff? Well, we're trying to help you guys get connected. So if you have questions or if you're wondering where do I go, if you'll just fill out that little card and th put it in the offering container later in the service, our team will get in contact with you, not show up at your house, send you a little something in the mail and a gift to say thank you, and we'll give you all the information you need to take next steps. Well, as you can see, it's a big weekend here at Milestone. You may have noticed over here to my right, your left, big group of students. Morning students, thank you guys for joining us. This weekend has been our fall retreat. We have almost 500 students going through our fall retreat and another 100 volunteers and 50 host homes. We wanna say thank you to all of you who participated and served to make that happen. We believe these moments matter. One weekend with God can change your life forever. So we're excited about everything that's happening in you students' lives. And thank you for all those who served and parents who brought them here. It's also Missions Weekend. Pastor Jeff has a great message. You're gonna be blown away by all the things God is doing through your faithfulness. But before he comes, turn around, find someone and tell them it's great to see you this morning at Milestone. At Milestone Church, we believe that people matter to God. Our heart has always been to reach, serve, love, and to give. We have a passion to meet needs and provide hope. And you may not know this, but you are helping reach people and build lives, both in our local community and around the world. This year, we launched one of our biggest initiatives ever, our first annual Serve Day. Over 1,300 volunteers from Milestone went out into the city of Keller and served on 30 different projects. Teams cleaned up Bear Creek Park, completed projects for Christ Haven for Children, and delivered lunches to local first responders. We also had a skilled projects team that cleared every code violation identified by the city of Keller and remodeled a home for a very deserving single mom. I had an air conditioning unit that rats had chewed the wires, that my plumbing had been backing up in my dishwasher. And we were living on mattresses on the floor. They moved me out and I stayed in a hotel for a week. And they came in and towels that were monogrammed with, you know, the initials for the boys and um, appliances that were replaced. And of course, the, the AC unit, dishwasher, um, beds. I mean, actual beds were not sleeping on the floor anymore. And I have the most beautiful bed. I feel like a princess. It's, it's a pleasure to make that bed every single day. It's 
really been a restoration of our whole lives and not just our house. Through our local outreach teams, we delivered welcome boxes to 1,100 new families in our area, gave backpacks to children of 100 single moms, and provided 3,600 meals to the homeless. We sent a team of 25 people to serve the city of Houston in the wake of Hurricane Harvey, and were able to collect $70,000 in needed items for disaster relief. We also launched Second Saturday Serve, happening each month, where multiple teams serve in a variety of ways, like ministering to the elderly, tutoring children of single moms and families in need, and hosting an outreach for refugees and their children. I am an ASL interpreter, and last summer I was given the opportunity to serve with the refugees. What I was praying for was uh, to meet a deaf refugee. And when we got there, I was able to meet about 14 of them and serve them and love on them and um, interpret prayers, which was my favorite. And it really, it really did change me. It really did change my heart. I haven't stopped going since. I keep on serving with them because it was just an awesome experience. To be able to use the gifts that he gave me was really awesome. In our desire to be the hands and feet of Jesus, we also partner with many like-minded ministries to bless people in our community. This October, we hosted a fairy tale ball for families with children who have life-threatening illnesses, like the Grossmans. We've been on about a six and a half year journey with our son, Jackson. He has a genetic disorder called neurofibromatosis one, also known as NF1. It causes tumors to grow on the ends of nerves. Fairy tale ball was awesome. The moment you walked into church, the electricity in the air was just phenomenal. All these little children were dressed up. They were so happy and you could just feel it. You could see it on their faces. For one night, every child here got to forget every difficulty they've gone through. They felt special for just that one night. Everything was gone, erased from their memories and just got to have fun and be like a normal child. But it was better than Disney World. That the children got to sit there and literally interact with all these princesses that at Disney World you see from a distance. And, and they felt so special. And I don't know how they did it, but those princesses knew their names. And the princess knew their names. And, and they truly felt like they were part of like royalty for the night. Milestone's reach goes beyond our local community. And this year, 130 people participated in global missions trips to places like Nicaragua, where we presented the gospel to over 6,400 people and saw over 1,200 come to Christ. And our medical and dental team treated over 1,500 patients, all because people stepped out in faith and said yes to God's call. People like the Ryan family, who served on a team in Guatemala it was my first time to actually sign up to even go on a missions trip. And, uh, but we decided just to, let's just go for it. Let's take the whole family, and, uh, which was a big step. We thought, I don't know how it's gonna happen, how we're gonna fundraise and all that stuff, but we just decided just to go for it. And the whole family was just super excited. It was so impactful seeing our kids just, like literally no fear. Like walking up to kids, grabbing them. Our daughter had a child on her hip at all times and just investing them. Our son was just on his knees hugging kids, investing in them, um, speaking publicly. And then even just with the kids on our team that went with us, they were just, they had older kids on the team that were pouring into them and our kids were pouring into the younger ones and just really seeing them step up in leadership in a different way and um, just ministering to kids, whether they spoke the same language or not. It was, language was not a barrier, um, just the way they loved on them kids. This year alone, over 4,300 Milestone volunteers have served over 20,500 hours, valued at $523,000. Thank you, Milestone Church, for generously giving your time, prayer, and resources to reach people and build lives in our local community and around the world. Come on. That's all of you. That's all of you loving and serving and giving to other people. Let's give God another round of applause for that. That's awesome. Phenomenal. If you're a guest with us, this is one weekend that is really a weekend where we love to celebrate. And then we also like to remind ourselves why it is that we do what we do all year long. 
And so that little video just captures just a small part of what's happening on a daily basis through you and your lives to impact the lives of other people. And so I want us to spend a little bit of time talking about how we can continue on and how maybe some of you that aren't engaged with what God's doing could understand how you could take a simple step to begin to participate. I gave you that little brochure as you came in. I'm going to ask you to try not to thumb through it too much and pay attention to what I'm talking about, but maybe sometime today or tomorrow you can really look at the detail of the lives that are impacted. I do want to highlight that not only through hours that you saw there, but financial resources of over $2 million given in our community. And I want to say, as many of you are, um, I'm your pastor, I want to say thank you to you because as a pastor, you moved to a city. And my dream was never just to have a, a large gathering of people. The reason we named our church Milestone Church is that means that you make a mark that you make a difference, that it matters that you're present in that area, and you're making a difference. It's not possible for me to make that difference by myself. It's not possible for our pastors, for our leaders, for our staff. It's really something that we can only do together, and that as we do it together, as we like to say we're in every one church, every person bringing their part and their piece, you look up and you're making a difference. You're making an impact. So Missions Weekend for me is not just me trying to stir you up towards something alone. It's really to celebrate the fact that you are doing it. You are doing it. And we want to continue and we want to seek what's on God's heart for us this coming year as we continue to make an impact on the lives of people in our area. I'm going to ask if you have your Bibles to turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 35 right there in the New Testament. If you don't have your Bible, maybe a mobile device, I'm going to put some things on the screen. I do want to draw your attention to one piece of information that we gave you as well. If you got this little card right here, just hold it up with me. This is a missions interest card. Come on, you're making me nervous. Somebody show them to me. Okay, you got them. This is something I'm going to come back to at the end, and I want to make sure you have it. This is a simple way for some of you who may want to just ask some questions about how you could engage, you'll do it through this card. I, I want to tell you, when it, when it comes to living life on mission, when it comes to a weekend like this, we're at all different stages and places. And I want to tell you that the biggest barrier is just to try it. Just, just to try it, just to step out and try to allow God to use your ordinary and to make something happen that's extraordinary. So I'm warning you, I took my first mission trip as a young boy to South Padre Island and had the opportunity to share the gospel and to help with some remodel projects. I've since taken my own children when they were very young into missions opportunities. I've seen my friends take their children. I've seen people, hundreds of people, just try it. I led my first person to Christ in the fifth grade. I warn you, if you try it, be careful. Be careful because if you ever start at any level getting outside of your own world and Partnering with Jesus, it can take you some wild and amazing places. It can take you to wild and amazing places. I thought about it this week, something I tried. You know, in life, a lot of times you try something, and before you know, it just goes into rapid places. Um, my wife, I grew up in East Texas, kind of home-style food, not a lot of spicy, but my wife, she loves spicy. So we started eating Asian food together, and some of you have heard me talk about it. She got me to try this sauce called sriracha. Come on now, how many of y'all are, are full on addicted like me? You are. I mean, a guy told me recently, said there's like ghost pepper sriracha. And he said, if you have hair, then it'll make it fall out. But if you don't, it'll make it grow. I said, well, I need to try that maybe. I don't know. But uh, he, he, this, this, this sauce, I mean, I just tried it and then I wanted more and more and more. And 
I was at an event. As many of you know, I love young people. By the way, young people, we, we, we love you. We celebrate what God's doing in your life. I want you to know we believe in you. We believe that you can stand in a dark culture, and we're cheering you on to make the right choices and to live out your destiny. So I was with a family in our church that I'm friends with. I remember when their daughter was very young, and we were having kind of a 13th coming of age sort of celebration, and um, in that house, there's a couple of girls who love to play jokes on their pastor. And so they're always got this joke or something they want to do. So we were having a real spiritual moment. And in the middle of the spiritual moment, they said, Pastor, we need you to do something to make the moment more special. So I'm game to make an idiot out of myself to help everyone else's entertainment happen. So they brought out this because they know I like sriracha. And so this is the way I <laughs> celebrated. Just, just trying to make it real, okay? I don't know if you try missions that you'll end up here, but I use it in all seriousness as a way to say when you, when you just start taking steps with God, it can lead you to places you may not even imagine where you're, you're just going to step out into unfamiliar territory. I know for a lot of you, when you start talking about missions and caring about people and the needs of others... I know you're at all different places. I, I know there, there's many of you who say, you know, I, I've been blessed. I, I've, I've achieved more than I thought. I have more resources than I thought. And there's something in you that just sort of nags at you that says, I, I, should, I should give some of this away. I, I should be less self-consumed. I, I should care. There's, there's something kind of tugging at you to say, hey, what do I do? I, I feel a need to help others because I've been blessed. There's others of you who have tried some things. You, you've tried. You've you tried maybe to get involved with this activity or you've given to this charity or you've tried some things or maybe you really have let Jesus' heart touch you and maybe you're a little frustrated because you feel like you're, you're giving yourself, you're serving or giving into something, but you're wondering, am I really making a difference? Am I really making a difference? Are we really seeing change? Are we contributing to the problem? Or are we really seeing the problem fixed? Is there some solutions coming into what I'm giving to? I'd like to share with you some things today that can help you with that. I know today a lot of more, there's a lot more information, there's a lot more exposure to needs than ever before. So some of you may be just a little bit overwhelmed going, you know, it's like there's so many needs, Jeff. There's, there's human trafficking and there's education and there's clean water and there's, there's all this stuff. And it's like, what do I do? Like, what do I address? Where do I go? Well, I'd like us to get some tools together that can help you start sorting out some of those things when it comes to living on mission with Jesus. And I think the best place to go is just to look at what Jesus had to say. Let, let's look at how Jesus lived. Let's look at Jesus' bio. This little section of scripture could have been on his bio because it really outlines how he lived. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues and he was proclaiming the good news. Notice Jesus did not disconnect helping others from proclaiming the message of the gospel that comes through his life. Why is it such good news? Because up until this point, Every person to have a relationship with God had to meet all the requirements and standards of the law they were trying to achieve. They were trying to, to know how do I get in a place where I'm made right. And Jesus, through his life, said, I'm going to give my life. I'm going to finish the work. You don't have to achieve your way to God. You don't have to become more religious. I'm going to give my life so that you can have life more abundantly. And that is a message that is good news. It's in Jesus. So he proclaimed that message of the kingdom, and he was healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. 
I'd like us to look at that word together a little bit. He had compassion. It's kind of an in vogue term. What does it mean? What is Jesus saying there? As I meditated on this passage this week, I thought, Jesus, what were you feeling? What were you seeing? What, what, what was that when you looked on those people and you had compassion for them? Can you help us just touch a little bit of that? A little bit of what you're feeling? He said he had compassion on them. And notice he said because they were harassed and helpless. By the way, there's a cultural issue. There's a sociopolitical issue there where there's an oppression and these people that he's looking at are under tyranny and they're being taken advantage of and they're being used and abused. But I believe here Jesus is not just saying they're harassed because they're culturally pushed down. They're helpless too because there's no one there to give them real answers, real life, real truth to help them with their internal issues, to help them with what can really help them. Notice he says they're like sheep without a shepherd. They need the good shepherd. See, the good shepherd doesn't just look at us and say, you're in a pitiful condition. You're harassed and helpless. He protects. He guides. He nurtures. He offers real solutions. Look what it says. Then he said to his disciples, notice the moment here where he looks at his disciples and he addresses the main issue for people finding real hope and real help. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The people willing to get their hands dirty in the mess are few. The workers are few. So he says, ask, ask God, pray this prayer, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out. See, when you, when you start stepping out in God, this is not Oh, I feel guilty because I have some things that people don't have. This is not a guilt motivation. This is not some kind of, look. oh, this is a hopeless situation, so I need to do something. When you're doing things Jesus' way, you're motivated by the fact that he sends you. He sends you into the situation. You're doing it for Jesus because he's sending you out into his harvest field. And I want to show you a little snapshot of this picture coming alive. We've had a lot of different initiatives that we share with you from single moms to elderly to a growing population of widows that we're now taking care of and resourcing and reaching so many different places, homeless, outreaches, a lot of things. And one of the new areas and pockets of our community that we begin to say, God, what are you wanting to do with this pocket of our community? And we begin to pray about it, and there's a team coming together, and we're thinking about veterans in our community who have served us. This is this weekend, a celebration for Veterans Day. Let me say to all of you that are, raise your hand if you're a veteran. Let's give them a round of applause in this room all over this community. Thank you. Thank you for your service. So after the next service, we have a special luncheon for veterans, and we're going to honor them. And I want to show you that there's a lot of components to honoring and serving and helping, but I want to show you how just an ordinary person, a fairly new follower of Christ, sees a need. Statistics say that, and I, I don't know the exact, I've been researching it, there's a statistic that says that 22 veterans a day commit suicide. I, I know there's people that challenge that, and that's not true. I, I, I don't know the exact number. What we do know is that there are a lot of people in this area that are troubled, and helping them and serving them is a complex issue, but we do not want to take out of the issue the internal need that can bring peace to the soul. And I want to show you a little story because the thesis for all of us on a missions weekend is that everyday people working together can make an eternal impact. Watch this video with me and see how God changed Sergeant Osteen's eternal future as a result of people loving him like Christ.
My first deployment overseas was to Iraq in 2006, and I was there for six months. A couple of days before Christmas, I was a senior analyst on the watch that day, and heard a call come over the radio that there had been an ID strike. By the time it took me to find them, which was all of about a minute or two, they had all died. Five of our Marines that were good friends of mine were killed. Played cards with these guys, knew them. One of them was 19. That was a rough day for everybody. I got out in August of 2014. That's when I got out of the Marines, I retired. My primary issue was, was holding on to the fact that people I knew didn't make it home, and I did. I didn't want to go anywhere. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to be around people. I couldn't. I wasn't capable of leaving my own home. Went to the VA for a disability rating, and I uh, had a couple of fractured discs in my back, and they started me on hydrocodone, and started taking more and more and more. That had become my life, and I couldn't believe that that's where I was. And whether I knew it or not, I had to open the door for the enemy to come in and attack me because my mind was so warped from all the medication that I couldn't hold it, I couldn't hold anything together. Did I have that feeling that I was gonna die? Yeah. Program after program after program, they were all just band-aids. There was always a missing component. I was having a psychotic mental break and I couldn't pile anything else on top of it and I broke. My wife had said, I, I'm gonna file for divorce. Up until that moment, it wasn't a reality. When I was officially handed that paperwork, it was official. Through a friend of mine, I met Roland, and I lived with him and his wife, and no doubt in my mind that the things he said to me were directly from God and God, God breathed and God given. And I remember him telling me, you're not gonna lose your family, and you're gonna go on and do some great things, and you don't even realize it. They were the ones who brought me into Milestone. The first sermon I heard was on marriage restoration. I remember sitting there and I looked up and I remember saying, did you see the paperwork I just got served with? How, why am I gonna <laughs> restore my family? I'm just trying, I mean, come on. It was the first time I'd ever been involved with a spiritual family like that to where I felt something on the inside. He had to fix me and my heart before there was any chance of ever fixing my family. I had a court date coming up to go over everything that I'd been served in. That was the day I asked God to come live inside me. I needed his help and I needed him because he was the only one that could fix this. And I had seen what he had done in my life leading up to that point. But now that I'm, I'm facing this appearance in court where I stood to lose everything. And I remember saying, I, I really need you. Please, please help me to rely on your understanding and not my own. And I just asked him, use me for whatever you need to use me for. And I'll, I'll listen. And I remember hearing very distinctly, I will deliver you. You're going to be OK. And all the stuff before, he took and moved it to the side and said, nope, this is my child, and this is who he really is. He's not all of those things that were on the paperwork. He's not any of that. And that's where I learned when Paul talks about casting off the old self and putting on the new self, that when that moment when I asked God to come and live inside my heart and inside me, I was a new creation in, in, in Christ. I had a clean slate. And that was what that was. That was a very defining moment in my life. That was my pivot point. I've made a lot of, a lot of decisions over my life, but that was the most important one that I had ever made was giving my life over to Christ that day. The beginning of the restoration process, this was the first time that we'd ever, ever put God at the head of our marriage. And I started to slowly see that change in her and, and most certainly in me. And nine months later, here I am. I have my family back, I have a wonderful job, and I have a wonderful place that I call my spiritual family. So my wife and I now volunteer on, on, on Dream Team. I, I'm on the safety team and I volunteer on Saturdays, usually the five o'clock service. And my wife Carol's on the hospitality team. Every broken relationship I had, had ever had with, with family had been restored and it was all because God and I had made that decision to hand my life over to Him. He had never left me. Isn't that an awesome story? <laughs> Only only Jesus can put a family back together. Only Jesus can make a broken soul and a broken life be restored and created fresh and new. 
So we see the power of how Jesus uses everyday people, but then Jesus does a work that only he can do. And it's not just because of the, the love, though the love is the entryway, but it's also because then you see Sergeant Osteen get connected and you see him go through the growth track and you see him, he's in a freedom group, our freedom ministry, where we have a lot of people going through that process. And next weekend we'll celebrate uh, with all of those that have been going through that process. And he had a small group who helped him move this week and he's experiencing what happens when we come together and we actually get involved in the issue. I want to talk to you about how Jesus does it. I want us to unpack a little bit Jesus' strategy for just a second, and I want to talk about how you can participate. How does Jesus really respond to the needs? What is this little snapshot that Jesus is giving us, and and how does Jesus do it? Because I know some of you are burdened about needs, you're burdened about people, or some of you are starting to be burdened, or many of you will be burdened. You're like, okay, what does Jesus do? Because I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. I think we just have to go back to Jesus' plan. The first thing we see in the story is this word compassion. Jesus has this compassion for people. What, What is compassion? Is it just a feeling? Well, actually, the word actually means co, passion, passion to suffer. It means to suffer with. It it doesn't mean just being aware of a problem. If you guys are okay with this, let me, let me share with you something in our culture today. We have equated compassion with awareness. Awareness. Sharing something on social media. Buying a pair of shoes because if this company and we buy the shoes, then they help the person, then, then, that, then that's compassion. Everybody smile at me, okay? That's not compassion. Compassion is when I actually let your pain touch me in a way to where I'm willing to be inconvenienced. Where I'm willing to make sacrifices in my own life to actually bring real solutions into that situation. So when compassion begins to touch us, we begin to not just think, oh, that's really bad. Oh, that's really terrible. I need to tell more people about how terrible it is. Nothing wrong with talking about issues, but real biblical compassion, the kind of compassion Jesus had, is let's do something about it. Let's do something about it. Let's get our hands dirty in the problem. The second thing in Jesus' strategy, if you look at it, is Jesus was also concerned with the eternal that's why he went and proclaimed the good news. That's why he understood that he proclaimed the good news, but he grabbed his disciples and said, you now are going to be having to deal with these things. You're going to carry this good news. He was training them because Jesus was also concerned with the eternal. If you look at Jesus, don't you love how Jesus met practical needs? We should meet practical needs. We should be concerned with the problems and situations that people had. Jesus was going, he was dealing with diseases. He was going to the outcasts, to the marginalized, to the people who felt like they were on the outside of everything that he had to offer. Jesus blows our mind with his ability to walk into all of these caustic situations and find the one, find the one that felt totally left out from God's plan. Jesus modeled that for us. But Jesus also modeled in those stories where he sat with a woman at the well, where there was a paralyzed person. He many times would say to them at the end, go and sin no more. Because the plight of humanity, the problem is sin. Sin is what breaks our worlds apart. The problem is sin. Are you saying, Jeff, well, that if someone's suffering, that's because they did something wrong? No, I'm talking about the general breakdown of the world due to sin. So Jesus was not just concerned with just their physical issue. He was concerned with their eternal destiny. He was concerned with their eternal future. And yes, that affects their here and now. Life more abundantly, life his way, all of that. But it affects their eternal future. And so that's so important for us to remember today. I am thankful for any person doing good to help people, to love people. 
And we're inundated with so many causes and so many different things. And thank God for anything that's trying to make a difference. Thank God for it. But we need to understand this. Yes, there is a global issue with water. Yes, there is a global issue with hunger. Yes, there is human trafficking. Yes, we're going to begin to reach out to veterans. Yes, we love single moms, but we have to understand this. We don't want people to be more educated when they're headed to hell. We don't want them to have a great cup of water but spend eternity in a place where there is no water. We have to remember there's a person who changes the lives of people, and his name is Jesus. And we are not offering real help unless they get in touch with the good shepherd because they can still be harassed and helpless if they don't have the good shepherd to give them the truth to live their lives by, to give them the help that they really need, lest they stay helpless. So I want to encourage you with that. Just as, It's like our single moms that we begin reaching out to. See, for us, it's not enough just to say, well, we want to help single moms, or we want to help widows, or even as we start helping veterans, or we help the homeless. It's not enough just to say, oh, there's a problem. We want to engage the problem. We have a person on staff, Shayla, who takes care of them, who works with our volunteers. I'm so amazed at the people in our church that go and mow their grass, that touch their lives. But for us, it's not enough for them just to have mowed grass and no eternal understanding of Jesus. So we start talking to them about Jesus, and then when they accept Jesus, then we help them get water baptized, and we help them get in the growth track, then we get them in Financial Peace University so they can learn how to handle their money. And yes, yes, we actually ask them to serve other people because their condition is found many times even in being inward, and so as you reach out to others, then you begin to grow, and so there's this, this understanding of eternity that has to be a part of the solution. Here's the final one. Jesus was looking toward his church when he said the problem is workers. He's saying to the disciples that you now are going to begin to take on these challenges of these people who are harassed and distressed and Jesus is looking toward. And I know some of you know this timeline, but some of you may not. You're like, what did Jesus do? I mean, he had all this compassion and he saw these distressed people. Well, here's what he did. He went to a bloody cross and he gave his life. And he didn't stay on that cross. He rose from the dead and he said, look, I'm not trying to make bad people better or good people better. I'm trying to, make, I'm trying to give you the opportunity to go from death to life. You can have the same power that raised me from the dead living on the inside of you. And then 120 ordinary, very, very ordinary. Everybody say ordinary. You're like, this is not me, Jeff. This is like some kind of professional Christians or some cause or organization. No, 120 ordinary people gathered in unison. He poured out the power of his spirit upon them. And not long after that, there was an explosion. People were being reached. Lives were being impacted. They were taking care of one another. They were loving one another. By Acts 6, they have to get separated into different gifts so they can continue on. And that's Jesus' plan. That's his plan. It's through his church, the manifold wisdom, as it says in Ephesians, the manifold wisdom and glory of God will be displayed through these ordinary people. These ordinary people, I'm not talking about just Milestone Church, I'm talking about his church, the church he died for, the church he's building today because he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In some sense today, there's so much rhetoric and so much dialogue about the problem, but a lot of times the church is left out of the discussion. The church is plan A. The church is his plan. And when ordinary people come together, I want to tell you, I remember on serve day, when 1,300 of you this spring in red shirts invaded our community, we went to the city, we dealt with every code violation that we could get. We had 30 projects, people cleaning up Bear Creek, working at an orphanage, serving our community in the name of Jesus. And I'll never forget, I was standing out here as this mob of people went everywhere. Our mayor stood here at our building dedication and said, our city would be different if it wasn't for these people. Our mayor and city council didn't even know it was happening. They started getting texts on their phone going, who are these people all over our city? It's called the church that gets out of the building and gets into the problem. 
And he stood here and said, you guys are making a difference. I'll never forget when all this mass of red shirts started converging back on the property and we were having a barbecue lunch. I grabbed a man in our church who's had a little bit of problems and he's had some, seen some things. He's a follower of Christ. He's been a little bit. See, the enemy wants to get us to think we can't live Jesus' plan, that it can't work. And he'd had a little bit, I'd been processing with him, and so he's new in our church, and I just pulled him to the side as a mass of red shirts converge on the property, and I looked at him and I said, the greatest powerful force in the earth is his church under the name of Jesus Christ. Look at it with your eyes. And when Jesus' mission touches you and you believe again that we together, not perfect, with all of our problems, when we get over our offenses, when we get past our petty issues, we really get touched with real compassion. We link arms and the church is unstoppable. Together, every single one of us. I'm gonna ask if you would, you say, Jeff, man, you make a biblical case. You're, 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 you're like, okay, what, what, do I, what do I do? You say, what are we gonna do this year? We're gonna do what we've been doing but the thought is, what if? What if everyone said, I'm going to bring what I have? What if? I'm going to ask you, if you would, to pull this little card out. And I want us to talk about what do we actually do, Jeff? What do we actually do? Well, number one, we have to pray. And I know that sounds like a preacher response, you know. For some of you who've been around church, it's like, okay, we're going to talk about what we need to do, and then we're going to get the token, let's pray. And I know you're going to leave here, and you're going to be like, he said we're supposed to pray about all these needs in our community. And you're like, what do I pray? You know, I'm going to bless my food and say, Lord, help all these people. And so it's just like, pray, what do I pray? Do I like get a map? Do I lay hands on a map? Do I get a city map? Do I, what, what do I do? Do I get some kind of cause and just start praying? What, what do I pray? Well, I know a few places in the Bible, Jesus would obviously pray so he could hear the, the mind of his father because he did what he told him to do. But there's a place in John 17 where he prayed for our unity. Because again, Jesus knew a unified people are unstoppable. He prayed for our unity. But right here, he gives us what we should pray. He said, here's what I want you to be asking God for. Ask God for laborers. Ask God for everyday people. I hope you leave here today infected with something. An everyday person who gets infected with the compassion of Jesus to the point that they feel this urge to be sent. You say, sent where, pastor? I don't know. Just ask him. He's looking for willingness. If you say, Lord, here I am, I'm willing, he will begin to direct you toward the need that he specifically has called you to. So what are we to pray? We're to pray for willingness. Willingness. Here's the second thing we have to do is we have to put that into action. And if you've never had an opportunity to say, hey, here's what I have, we have everything from construction teams to tutors to lawn mowing to financial advisors to ways you can serve children. I love this story of this, these kids with life-threatening illnesses. Amazing to me. I spoke with a Keller, the, the video there, Sergeant, uh, uh, Officer Grossman, he's a police, a Keller police officer, and that's his son. And I spoke with him, and he's, he's just talked about the power of, of what happened at that event where I love what his wife said. He's like, yeah, we went on a make-a-wish thing. This was better than Disney. I don't know how. They knew their names. It's amazing. Just Did you know you can make a difference in someone's life just by knowing their name, just by being willing to reach out? And so there's so many opportunities. I'm going to ask you if you're just interested. Maybe you say, I don't even know. Well, just put your name on it, and our missions team would love the opportunity to reach out to you and just even discuss it. Here's the final thing that I'm going to ask you to do, and that is I'm going to ask you to give. I'm going to ask you to give, and you say, Pastor, what are we giving to? Because of your faithfulness with tithing and giving, we're on budget. We're doing great as a church. Um, we're, we're going to meet all of our financial obligations for the year. We're going to serve our community. We have these events planned. We're going to serve people, but 
What could happen if all of us were to say this year, you're going to have some plans for end of the year giving? Your mailbox is going to begin to fill up with all kinds of opportunities. There's going to be multiple places as we enter into this Christmas season and holiday season. And I want to say to you, unapologetically, I believe when you invest in what God's doing through the local church, you're making a great investment. So if you're thinking about end of the year giving, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask us as a goal for the end of this year, for a goal of $250,000 that we can take all of that, we're going to take this weekend's offering, we're going to put it toward that. So what you give this week online or here, we're putting it toward that. You say, where's that going to go? Well, we have a joy event and we have a growing number of single moms. Last year, we gave them over $800,000 in gifts and resources. And so we have more single moms than ever. So we're going to be resourcing single moms. We have a veterans initiative that's coming up. We have a lot of things that we're giving toward and, and you, you see those in the pamphlet there. Uh, a lot of things, uh, as we've moved in the building, we have a growing number of needs. We have our Christmas Compassion Uh, that we do every year where we help families in our community. So those resources will go towards that. We have more extra local mission trips than we've ever had before. So we're touching more lives than ever. And so for us as a church, I would encourage you as you just pray about the end of the year, giving toward these resources going into the practical lives of everyday people throughout the end of the year, okay? I'm gonna ask if you would to bow your heads with me. We're so thankful of what Jesus is doing through you every single day. We're so thankful for the opportunity to be able to be used by Jesus to impact the lives of people for all eternity. If you're here and listening or maybe watching online and you're like, Jeff, you're talking about a Jesus who loves me right where I am and I'm thinking about my eternal future, I'm thinking about my future here without Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you that message Jesus proclaimed, it's still being proclaimed today. There's no other name under heaven whereby you can be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, I want to tell you right now you can. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to try to get better right where you are. You can just simply say, Jesus, I believe you died on that cross for me. You know where I've missed the mark. You know me intimately. You know that I'm not right with you. You just say it to him. Tell him. He understands it. Jesus, I believe you rose from the dead. I want that resurrection power. I want a relationship with you, Jesus. Will you be my Jesus, my Lord, my Savior? I confess you as my Lord today. I want to live for you. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to let us know so you can take a next step for water baptism. You can take a next step to learn how to grow in your relationship with Jesus. But I want to pray for all of us here. Jesus, would you touch us with what you saw? Would you touch us with what you felt? Would you touch us with what you did? We don't need to reinvent what you did. We just need to partner with you in what you're still doing. So today, Lord, I pray you would send us. We do what you told us to do. We ask you for willing hearts, for laborers to go into your harvest. And we ask you that you might touch us in a way that you would rearrange our perspectives in our lives in such a way that we would be willing. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. We're going to receive our special missions offering. Put that interest card in there or the communication card. I do want to honor some people as well. I'm going to ask Stacy Hatcher, our missions director, and her team to stand up right now. Would you guys celebrate them? Stacy is a medical doctor, left her practice. She and her team work tirelessly every day. All of that impact that you see comes from them helping everyday people get engaged. All right, would you give them another round of applause? I'm so proud of them. God bless you as you give. Oh, I will build my life
were inspired and encouraged by the great news of all that's happening through your faithfulness, I want to ask our ministry team to come down. If there's anything that you need prayer for, if there's a question maybe that you have or a situation that you're going through, these men and women would love to be able to just stand and agree and encourage you any way possible. One more thing before you leave on your way out. Tonight we're having a worship night here at the building. 6.30 will be a great time of worship, little teaching, encouragement. Pastor Jeff has a fun announcement there as well. So join us tonight at 6.30. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.